And Andy McCarthy over at National Review, he also covered this bombshell. And everybody else except for my show on Fox News ignored it. Going to Andy McCarthy's piece, during the Obama years, the National Security Agency intentionally and routinely intercepted, reviewed communications of American citizens in violation of the Constitution and of court-ordered guidelines implemented pursuant to federal law. The unlawful surveillance appears to have been a massive abuse of the government's Foreign Intelligence Collection Authority carried out for the purpose of monitoring communications of Americans in the United States. Remember I told you this is far more widespread. Then it goes on, while aware that it was going on for an extensive period of time, the administration failed to disclose its unlawful surveillance of Americans until October 2016 when the administration was winding down and the NSA needed to meet a court deadline in order to renew various surveillance authorities under the FISA Act. The administration stonewalling, the Obama administration stonewalling about the scope of the violation induced an exasperated foreign intelligence surveillance court to accuse the NSA of, quote, an institutional lack of candor. It's a nice way of saying lying. In connection with what the court described as a, quote, very serious Fourth, very serious fourth Amendment issue. Sound familiar? We've been telling you. The unlawful surveillance was first expressed by Solomon and Sarah Carter, who have also gotten access to internal and classified reports. And according to these uh, reports um, by Carter and Solomon, the illegal surveillance may involve five more than 5% of NSA searches of databases derived from what they call upstream collection of Internet communications. Of special concern to the FISA court was the use of identifiers of American citizens as selection terms for database searches. Remember I was telling you about the the use of, of these warrants and spying on American citizens and surveillance and then the lack of minimization when they find out it's an innocent American on the line and then unmasking Samantha Powers, uh, unmasked 300 people. Well, why would a U.N. ambassador ever, ever have to do that? That was in a year's period. Yeah, apparently it was more, more widespread. I'm going to have a big report on this tonight on Hannity. Joe DeGeneva will touch on it next, too. Amazing developments. It's like every hour of every day. Um, the Wall Street Journal had an interesting piece out today how the uh, House and Senate investigators are now focusing on this guy, Cody Shearer, and uh, re- both Republicans in the House committee and the Senate committee. And this is Hillary Clinton's top dirty trickster. And what role he played in generating the most salacious allegations in Steele's anti-Trump dossier and how many people may have bought this nonsense. Anyway, Shear's notes uh, were passed indirectly to uh, Steele and multiple people familiar with the matter uh, said that who gave them to federal law enforcement, the information was passed from Mr. Shear through Sidney Blumenthal, Sid Vicious, a close associate of the Clintons and another official who worked at the State Department. See how corrupt this all is? We'll break it down. Joe DeGeneva and Victoria Tunsing are next. No one will read the bill. No one knows what's in it. And there is no reform in the bill. That I can say with absolute certitude. No one will read it. No reform. Nothing gets better. The debt will grow. How come you were against President Obama's deficits? And then how come you're for Republican deficits? Isn't that the very definition of intellectual dishonesty? If you were against President Obama's deficits and now you're for the Republican deficits, isn't that the very definition of hypocrisy? All right, that was Senator Rand Paul on the Senate floor yesterday, apparently annoying a lot of his fellow senators, but standing up for the right thing. Upon which, too, uh, I guess Bette Midler is hoping that uh, some lunatic comes back into his house and starts beating on him again, which is a separate question. Uh, Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky joins us now. Hour two, Sean Hannity Show. How are you? Hey, Sean. Pretty good. Yeah, I well, think I might be one of the least popular people on Capitol Hill right now. Senator, there's nothing you said there that's not true. I, I do believe we need the $80 billion in more defense spending. I really do. Uh, I think we've allowed our military 
to deteriorate to a certain extent. I think we are far too extended around the world. That needs to end. We can't be the world's policemen. We have to make certain strategic positions, but the amount of money and the amount of debt we're accumulating was something I was whining and complaining about under the Obama years, and, and we're not stopping it. Well, you know, I take it very personally because, you know, I ran for office. You remember when I ran? I came on your program on television and on the radio in 2009, 2010, and we were alarmed at annual deficits approaching and exceeding a trillion dollars under President Obama, and we were unified. There was this voice. The whole Tea Party movement arose because we were so concerned with so much debt being accumulated and all of this spending, and we rose in one voice. You remember the rallies, over 100,000 people in the mall in Washington, D.C., saying we can't spend money we don't have. And so now for Republicans to have the same thing, to have deficits that will exceed a trillion dollars in one year, um, it just can't be. We people are, are not going are going to wonder who we are as a party or as conservatives if we complained about President Obama and then we do the same thing. Well, what are we going to do now? Because this is now it. This is the bill. This has been been passed. This is a two year deal. And while I believe we're going to see significant economic growth, and I believe that growth will generate a lot of revenues in Reagan's years, we doubled the revenues to the government. We've seen record revenues, but you know the problem in Reagan's years is for every new dollar they brought in, Congress spends a dollar thirty-two. You can't balance a budget that way. <laughs> well, and that's exactly what's going to have now. Any any growth in revenue from growth in the economy is going to be frittered away in new spending. And uh, but the interesting thing is, is though they've raised the spending caps for two years, you realize this is only a month-long bill. We're going to be back having the same fight in a month, but they probably won't touch the caps in a month, but they'll have to re-vote on spending in a month. So my plan is to bring up the amendment again to try to have fiscal restraint by having spending caps and to try to reinstitute them. But in all likelihood, I'll lose because we don't have enough votes. And so the only thing people can do, and I know a lot of your listeners are frustrated, is there will be Republican primaries. Look at the candidates long and hard and try to vote for the ones who are unafraid to stand on their own two feet, unafraid to say enough's enough, we're not going to add more debt, and unafraid to vote against spending. And really it does take some courage because there's a, a certain amount of groupthink that goes on and a certain amount of uh, you know coercive pressure, a certain amount of uh, you, know, you have to be one of the club and you'll be expelled if you don't toe the line. And uh, you need candidates that uh, will stand out and, and be brave. And you can tell that somewhat by yeah, some there's, of the, there's the very few of you. I mean, remember in 2013, you actually went down to offer him support. Ted Cruz was saying we can end uh, Obamacare. We have the authority to defund it. And they were never serious about it. We, we learned in you know, 2017, you have seven colleagues that voted for your bill, which was to just repeal it. As straight repeal yeah. of Obamacare, 2017, when it would have worked and it would have mattered, the seven of them changed their mind uh, magically, which tells me they were never serious about that vote in the first place. It was a show vote. Yeah, and the way I look at it is this, is that so many of these people are just weak need, and they, they have insufficient confidence in capitalism and freedom. Free people, free minds, free interactions, voluntary transactions does amazing things. The wealth of our country is just extraordinary, and we need to apply those same principles to health care that we apply to every other facet of our economy. We don't have price controls in anywhere else in the economy. We don't have the government fixing the prices. We allow prices to go up and down. We let people save. There are all kinds of ways we could fix. And one of the things I'm going to do this spring is the Republican leadership has said they're not going to introduce a budget. I'm going to introduce my own budget, and my budget will be a freeze in spending. And what we'll also introduce is budget reconciliation instructions to expand HSAs. I want to expand HSAs significantly, so it would be a significant tax cut because you get to deduct that, uh, what you put in your HSA, your health savings account. And then I'm going to let people take their HSA, and I'm going to let them use it for diet plans, exercise plans, vitamins, for a variety of things. So we're going to let you put more money in your HSA and let you use it for more things. But the only thing, only way we can get that done is to be able to convince Republicans to vote for a budget and vote for budget reconciliation instructions that I'll introduce. But because it's a privileged resolution, I may well be able to get a vote on this uh, coming up in April. Let me ask you about the FISA extension, too. Interesting how that passes before we get the Nunes memo from the House Intel Committee. And I thought it was even more explosive in the Grassley-Graham unredacted memo, which I've been spending a lot of time on. 
and we've learned an awful lot of things here. We know the bulk of the FISA warrant against an opposition candidate, in this case the Trump campaign, and then an incoming president, came from Hillary Clinton's bought-and-paid-for phony, salacious Russian government in part, but Russian dossier. She she bought and paid for this thing, and not only was it designed to lie to and manipulate the American people with those lies before an election, but then it became the basis for a FISA warrant, and they became the bulk of the evidence, and it was also renewed three separate times with it again being the bulk of evidence. Now, uh, I know you care about our Constitution, Senator Paul. Uh, I care about our Constitution. You're very well versed in the Fourth Amendment against unreasonable search and seizure. You know, this this was the concern of many of us when we were debating the FISA law when it first came up. I think what's become very apparent and sort of is incontrovertible is that we had biased people and do have biased people in the FBI who hated the president, hated the candidate, Donald Trump. And we're actually plotting and discussing trying to prevent him becoming president at work, on their work phones, in meetings at work. You've got Strzok. You've got his, his mistress, Paige, but also going to McCabe's office and really discussing how they can prevent Donald Trump from becoming president. So we know that there is bias. And when we know this is, can happen, it basically says what James Madison told us from the very beginning, that men are not angels. And because men are not angels, they need rules and they need restrictions on their behavior and their power. And one of the checks and balances was basically that anyone who had the power to search a home would have to first ask a judge for a warrant. And this check and balance has worked and served us well for 200 years. But I think the example of having so many biased people up there that are trying to bring the president down is evidence of why we need a warrant requirement. These people should not be allowed to search the database. And this is what I asked the FBI director last week. I said, can Strzok and can Lisa Page and uh, Bruce Orr, can they still search this database? Could they type in uh, Americans who gave money to Donald Trump and look them up for their pleasure and try to bring them down for phony trumped-up tax charges? Can they look at this database and try to develop cases against Trump supporters uh, without a warrant? If they don't have a warrant, they could be sitting in their office as we speak doing this. And so this is why I requested in in the legislation that we put forward was that there be a, a requirement that you get a judge's warrant. Um, I've talked to the president about this. I think he's sympathetic to it, and uh, I think that we can still revisit it. We lost the vote the last time, but it was on a bigger bill. Uh, my hope is that we revisit this and we just specifically ask one thing, that any time an FBI agent or anybody from the Department of Justice wants to type in an American's name, they have to ask a judge first. Well, I, I I think that. But what do you, what happens when we know now that when this was presented to the judge for the FISA warrant in this case, we know that they knew that it was Hillary Clinton bought and paid for, DNC bought and paid for, and all they did was add a footnote saying it might have a, a political taint to it, and that was it. They purposely withheld that from the FISA judge. Andrew McCabe even acknowledged and admitted without the phony dossier – and the Russian dossier, there is no warrant. So at some well, point, you know, if you lie to a you, FISA judge have, this way to spy on an American citizen, right? Even if you have a cursory understanding of the law and, and watch legal shows on TV, you realize that when the prosecutor doesn't tell the defense attorney about evidence, they call it exculpatory evidence, evidence right. that might prove or, or bring doubt to the case. A lot of times the judge will throw out all charges because they said you, you didn't play the uh, – the game of justice fair. The game of justice is that you have to reveal your evidence. The prosecutor has to reveal that to the defense attorney so the defense attorney can prepare a defense. So in this case, there's no defense attorney. There's only the prosecutor. But if the prosecutor is dishonest or deceitful and doesn't tell the judge that this came from the Hillary Clinton campaign, um, I think it taints the whole the whole investigation. And really, I hope Mueller is looking at this, and I hope Mueller is saying to himself, I can't believe they started this with a Hillary Clinton oppo hit piece on Trump. Well, I want to and pick up right there. there well, we got to take a quick break, though, if you don't mind. Uh, Senator Rand Paul is with us, uh, and I want to ask you about that. 800 941 Sean, if you want to be a part of the program. A lot more news we're getting to in the course of the program. Victoria Tunsing represents the informant in the Uranium One case. Also, Joe DeGeneva has been very critical of uh, what has happened with this FISA warrant, the dishonesty before the court, and so much more. 
All right, as we continue, Senator Rand Paul of Kentucky uh, single-handedly drove the United States Senate nuts last night. But for all the right reasons, standing up for fiscal responsibility and, and other issues, we're talking about the, the FISA warrant bought and paid for, Hillary Clinton uh, warrant, basically. 